If you've only got two subwoofers to work with on your show, I hope you know that there's more options than just placing them left and right on the sides of your stage. There's actually at least five more we're gonna walk through today for a total of six. So on any show, it's up to you to determine where the speakers are gonna go. This could be you're a mobile DJ, maybe a portable church, or just an A1 that's mixing a smaller show with just two subs. And we need to be able to determine what's the optimal placement and arrangement to achieve our show's goals. And left, right may not always be that. Maybe we could put them in the center, maybe we could stack them. So anyway, we're gonna be jumping into those examples, assessing the pros and cons when you might use them uh, in a modeling software called Map XT. Super excited about it, but if you're to get great results out of your sound system, I've got a resource for you. It's my audio math survival spreadsheet. You can get that at the link below or at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. If you really want to understand more what's under the hood and how sound actually works, this would be a great jumping off point to get comfortable with how frequency, period, and wavelength are related. We'll talk about phase delay, understanding voltage a little bit more. But one calculator we're going to be using today is the inline gradient subarray planner because uh, options number five and six of we're looking at today are both cardioid setups. So that requires a little bit of knowledge, a little bit more knowledge of how to finesse their placement and delay times and, and, the, and the relative phase between each of the two cabinets to get some rejection in the rear and summation in the front, which is cool. It's what we want. We want the energy to go forward and then behind it, not having this energy spilling on stage. With this one, you can simply put in the crossover frequency that you're looking for, and it will tell you the max summation frequency where we're gonna get the most amount of coupling between those two subs. And then the rear offset distance where to place that rear sub and then the rear sub delay value, because you actually have to delay this up as well. If you want to dive super nerdy and deep into cardioid subs, I've got tutorials on my channel, uh, inline gradient cardioid sub tutorial and an inverted gradient. So we're going to be looking at both of those today, not diving deep into how they work, but how you can use them. So anyway, check those out at the link below. I think you would love having this calculator over 30 different ones in here at this point. So let's jump right into our prediction software and step through each of our six setups. All right, so we're here in Map XT, and here is our first setup, and is the stacked center setup. So this is, we're looking at a top-down view. Here is our stage, and then our audience would be out here. So in Map XT, I can't show you the, the side view as well, so we're just looking top-down, so it just looks like there's one sub. But if we were looking at it from the side, it would be two cabinets like this, and they would be both facing this way. So that this is the stacked center. And we're going to be looking at two different frequencies for each prediction. First, 63, and it'll be going up to 100 hertz. Because that's usually the top end of the sub range we are worried about. And 63 is usually right in the middle. So let's look at a stacked sub setup. They're all coming from basically the same point in space. And hear that, 63 hertz. And we see that it's a circle. It is omni. So low frequencies being very long in wavelength, uh, are, are not easy to steer, at least by mechanical means. So we have this sphere of energy. So we have a lot of energy on stage, which may or may not be desirable. If it's a hip hop concert, your artist probably wants to hear it on stage. But the nice thing about this is it's all coming from one place. It's localized to the middle and it's radiating out equally throughout your audience. We're gonna be looking at a later setup, which is the left, right uh, spacing while looking at those power alleys and valleys and how that makes it uneven throughout your audience. So a center sub setup makes it powerful. You get the most amount of energy and coupling. There's nothing fighting. It's all coming from one spot um, and is localized to the stage. So I like a center sub setup if I can do it. Of course, the, the caveat to this is if uh, the event promoter or whatever doesn't want uh, a stack of subs in front of the stage or anything in front of the stage, so you're not always able to do this. And if your stage isn't very tall, let's say it's, you know, a three foot tall stage. If you've got two, two, two foot tall calves, it's going to stick up in front and that could look kind of weird. So stacking them may not always be the solution. Let's look at a hundred Hertz. I'll move on to our other setups and we can see that's slightly narrower than that perfect sphere we saw at 63 Hertz, but that's what's happening there. So center sub. It's powerful, it's localized in the center, it's efficient, and it could be cool, but the stack is high. So what if we actually took those two off and put them next to each other, and now we have the side-by-side -side center setup. This is gonna be really similar. Go back down to 63, 63 hertz, 
And now it's radiating out like a sphere again, almost the exact same shape. Moving on up to 100 hertz, we are going to see a slight narrowing. So it's getting a little bit tighter here because as we start to displace two different subs, we're going to see their relative time arrivals with each other uh, change. So that's why we're getting this sphere and really tight coupled energy when they're together is because there's no timing difference or very little timing difference between these two subs. So by spreading them apart, and they're arriving at different places at different times, meaning they're combining at different points in their phase cycle, which I know this is getting nerdy in a hurry, but by if they're combining at different points in their phase cycle, they could add together, they could do a stalemate, or they could cancel out. So anyway, but I like doing this one a lot. If I have uh, just two subs, it's a low stage, and I'm not too concerned about low end coming back on the stage and I uh, can't get too fancy with it with the cardioid setup. It's quick, it's easy, put them both in the center and away you go. You could just daisy chain the inputs if they're active boxes. So that was 63 Hertz. We looked at hundred Hertz there. So our next setup is calling the half wavelength crossover center. All right, for those of you who are new to the channel or not quite as nerdy as me, I'll try to step through this slowly, but a Wavelength is how long it takes for a, uh, the, a, let's call it just a 100 hertz sine wave coming out of a speaker to complete a full circle. So to go completely uh, up and then down and back through and back to resting point. It travels 11.3 feet when it does that. So 100 hertz is also a common crossover frequency, especially in smaller format systems. So if we space it, up to that point, that means we're, we're actually going to start narrowing the coverage of that speaker pattern. There, so we'll start at 100 hertz first and move down to 63, hit predict. And we now have taken what was our orb, our circle now squished it down into a figure eight. So this is similar to a figure eight pattern on a ribbon microphone, right? You can have other microphones that have ribbon uh, figure eight patterns as well. But what's happening is that the arrival time of this top sub and this what top and bottom, or I guess left and right really, but spaced a, they're spaced a half wavelength apart is that they're arriving in time here, but because of their physical offset, when they're arriving here and here, they're actually arriving a half wavelength offset from each other. And so what's the issue with the half wavelength offset? If we have our wave going up and down here, then we have its mirror image going down then up and down, then up, very similar to a polarity inversion, they're gonna cancel out. So that's what's happening, is we're actually getting cancellation on the sides, then full summation in the front. And that's kind of this uh, pivot point of once we get beyond half wavelength, is when we start getting power alleys and valleys. And before that, we get summation, and we get from an orb that's slowly squished into this figure eight kind of donut thing, which is, or I guess, more like a long john, maybe, I guess. So that's what's happening here. So I would do this setup when I have a very skinny or long, narrow room, almost like a galley kitchen for a venue. I would take these subs and pull them apart up, pull them apart up to a half wavelength of my crossover frequency. Cause that's when I'm gonna start handing off to my mains um, and wherever my mains are gonna take over what's happening. But I want to widen them as much as I can without sacrificing the pattern breaking apart like it would in a left right setup, which we'll get to next. So if we move on down to 63 Hertz, just to see what that looks like, we hit predict. And now what was that sphere is squished into uh, not quite a long John, but maybe a, a cream filled donut. I guess I'm really hungry right now. But anyway, that's that setup. So we can pull our subs apart a little bit and figure that out. And if you just want a quick way to do that, you can put in here in my audio mass survival spreadsheet, you can go to the very top. I also have a metric version now, which is cool. So the first half is metric and this is Imperial. So put in at 100 hertz, which is our crossover frequency. And right here it says half wavelength, and that's 5.66 feet. And that is the spacing I have between these two, and you can space them accordingly. And this is going to be different if you add another sub and another sub, another sub. This is just for two subs if you want to get the narrowest pattern that you can. All right, moving on to our fourth setup. We have the classic left-right space. So this is a 40 foot wide by 20 foot deep stage. And let's look at 63 Hertz here. 
Ah, and here we are. We have our power allies and valleys. Again, this is because of their spacing that they're going through their phase cycle and then arriving at different points in space at different points in their phase cycle. So someone who is standing here, and just to be clear, this is a, a SPL map. You almost read it like a weather map. This is heavy rain, match this color right here. Uh, it's at that level. I think that's the right color. And then here down in this dark blue, this looks like if we're at negative 18 down to negative 36, so this person is going to feel the kick drum at 63 hertz in their chest, nice and nice and strong right here. But this person at the same depth in the audience is not going to hear it much at all, which isn't good. So this isn't quite so bad if you're in an indoor venue because everything bouncing around in the venue can kind of help fill in those gaps. But if you're outside, it's very pronounced. You can just play a sine wave at 63 hertz and walk laterally across your audience and it you'll hear it go boom and then die down in venue in level and then come back. It's not fun. So let's see what it looks like at 100 hertz. And we just get more petals on this flower that's that's rotating around and it'll get tighter and tighter and more petals the higher we go in frequency. So it's different at every frequency. And so you can't really say, oh, here it's definitely gonna be right. The only time it's going to be at all frequencies start your sub range at the same level is here down the center right here, but everywhere else that pattern's gonna be different. So that's why I don't like doing left, right, if I don't have to. Sometimes, again, you have to. I just want you to be aware of what's happening and not try to fix it with EQ if you have something happening um, and you, you, you go and measure the system, you're like, oh wow, I have like no 100 hertz and you start to boost it. That's just gonna make it uh, be hotter at the places where it's already hot and probably not do all that much where it's canceling out. You cannot solve a timing problem with an electronic EQ solution. Anyway, so that's what's happening there with the left, right setup. Again, you can do it. I've had to do it in several shows. You can still have a good show, but just be aware this is what's happening to your low end when you have to pull them that far apart. And you may think, well, is it that bad if they're maybe like 20 feet apart? Just to show you, let me put this one here about 20 feet apart. We'll check it out. Uh, sorry. Here we go. 20 feet apart. And we still get some weird stuff happening at 100. We actually have a huge side lobe happening here. We have the most amount of energy going to the side because it's probably, uh, let's see. Oh, this was 20 feet or 40 feet apart. It's 20, so that's double the wavelength of 100. So we're getting a side lobe. Anyway. And now here at 63, weird stuff too. So anyway, that's what's happening. We have to pull them apart. Just be aware. We'll hide this now and move on to some fancy stuff. We got a cardioid setup, an inline gradient cardioid uh, center setup. So let me slow that down for you. Here we have two subs, one right in front of the other. So if we were viewing it from the side, it would be here. They're both facing forward. And if we go back to the inline gradient cardioid sub planner here in my spreadsheet, I put in my crossover of 100 hertz and it told me my max summation frequency is 63 hertz. And this told me my rear sub offset distance. So the rear sub, so basically measuring from the front driver of this sub to the rear driver of this sub is four and a half feet, basically. And that's how I displace them. And then I also go to this rear sub and add an equal amount of delay, electronic delay, which is what's equal to that distance offset. And that's about 3.97 milliseconds. So I've added that. So this sub is displaced both in time with an electronic delay. And then we also add a polarity inversion. And how I'm, I'm doing that is here in map XT is in device configuration I have this rear sub on output number two, inverting the polarity, delaying it by that much. I have the physical offset, and this is the response we get at 63 hertz. I'll zoom out now. And we have a lot of energy re or rejection or not much on stage, and it's all going forward. And this is the beauty of a cardioid sub setup. So just like a cardioid microphone, it does not listen to what's behind it, rejects it, and it picks up in the front. We can get our subs to do the same. So I know I stepped through the, that recipe quickly, but please check out on my channel, the Inline Gradient Cardioid Sub Tutorial, and it walks you through step-by-step step how it works, why it works. And I also have one for this next setup, the Inverted Gradient Sub setup. Anyway, 
So I wouldn't spend too much time here, but just know that if you only have two sub setups, you can still do really powerful things with it. And so I like that you can have a lot of rejection on stage. So if I'm mixing a bluegrass band and it's an upright bass, that has an open microphone on it, you betcha I'm gonna really fight hard to try and get this set up because I don't want low end coming back into my microphone causing feedback. I still want a nice strong low end uh, without having to fight myself with feedback the whole time or maybe just an acoustic band with um, just a lot of instruments open, just keeping low end out of my microphones and out towards the audience is a really good thing. Moving on to our inverted gradient. So this one, is where we actually have two subs, one on top of the other, just stacked. One is facing forward and one is facing backward. But it's the exact same recipe that we had earlier. We're gonna measure the distance offset of the front driver to rear driver. In this case, it was 2.17 feet. And that's what it was. And so we're gonna, that's our physical displacement. We're also gonna add that amount in delay. So a quick way to go from feet to time in milliseconds is multiply by 0.88. So 2.17 times 0.88. So we added that amount of delay to that bottom sub. And then we did a polarity inversion. Again, we can see all that in settings, device configuration, the hotkey wasn't working either. And it's 2.17 milliseconds is what we had. Uh, so I guess, Earlier, I had a little bit different spacing. Basically, that's why I've added, that's the spacing here. And now let's look at 63 hertz. Sorry, I keep doing my zoom tool wrong. Hitting predict. And really similar pattern to what we had, but we have a tiny little lobe here in the back. So again, not quite as effective overall for, for getting complete rejection in the rear, but still really great nonetheless to have a lot of low end not on stage. And let's look here at 100 hertz as well. And here we are, very similar. So that's, that's a really similar shape across all frequencies. And you might be asking, well, how come you don't have a seventh setup with an end fire setup that looks really similar to the inline gradient? It's actually the, the inverse of the inline gradient. In the inline gradient, we are aligning at the rear sub and getting cancellation in the back. End fire, we actually ask the front sub to wait for the first one to catch up to it and then propel out forward. The reason why I don't like just a two element end fire is that you're only canceling at one frequency in the back. Um, and so you're not getting the full or broadband cancellation. If you have a three or four element end fire, this starts to get a lot more effective, but I usually don't like doing two element end fires unless it's coupled with the big main system, therefore making it a three element end fire. So that's, that's a little bit nerdy in the weeds, but um, just wanted to have that caveat, caveat for you just in case you were wondering. All right, so a recap here. If you just got two subs, you have six different options at least for making it happen. You can put them close together in a stack, side by side in a stack. You can pull them apart up to a half wavelength of your crossover frequency if you need to get it really narrow. You can also do them just space left, right, but should be aware of the power alleys and valleys. You can do an inline gradient, one in front of the other, apply delay and polarity offset to the rear sub so you can get a cardioid pattern, or you can do an inverted gradient stack, which is stacking one on top of the other. I would have the bottom one facing forward or back, depending on where you want the cancellation to go. Same recipe as our other one and still get a nice cardioid setup. All right. That was, that was a lot of fun. I'm glad that was, I hope that was helpful for you with your setups on your coming shows. Make sure and grab my Audio Mass Survival spreadsheet at the link below and I will catch you next time.